you mentioned the ecological footprint. I described it a little bit earlier. It was a, a metaphorical concept. I had no idea that it would become within a decade, probably the best uh, known indicator of, of sustainability, at least among people who even begin to think that way. So the, the idea, the idea that we are so intimately connected to the ecosphere, it never occurred to most people. It just had to be birthed in language. Yes. You see what I'm saying? Ecological footprint is just a linguistic term, but it captures so much because people see an imprint, it's on the land, and they make that mental connection. William Reese, you have been somebody that has been a, um, an intellectual mentor. Um, my most important intellectual mentor is William R. Catton Jr. His book, Overshoot, was so foundational. And you are carrying that torch with your work and the ecological footprint and just everything that you do. And so I just welcome you to this series because this post-Doom Conversation series is really intended to be about having conversations with people who get the big picture and who understand our predicament and why we are in the mess we are and what's possible and what's not really possible going forward. And yet also staying in a positive heart space to make as big a contribution as, as we can. So thank you for being part of this series. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for that flattering introduction. And I'm really thrilled to be on here uh, because of your role in metaphors are so important and applied population ecology is so important. So translating the ecological notion of carrying capacity into the ecological footprint, I mean, who doesn't know about that? And now it's translated also into carbon footprint. It's so important. And we're just a few weeks before the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. And so it's a delight to have you on. And we're going to go through your experience of the ecological understandings and the public understandings and resistances to ecological caring capacity um, and the human footprint. But before we go there, Bill, it, for people who are watching this or who are listening to this, who may not be familiar with you, they've never read your stuff, they've never watched or listened to anything, help us just get you, like in a nutshell, like uh, share, and don't be bashful, but share what you're best known for, what you're passionate about, what you've done career-wise. So help the uninitiated to know who you are. I suppose I'm best known for the, the ecological footprint concept, but I've written about everything from basic ecology to human cognitive psychology and some of the problems in uh, the evolutionary development of the human nervous system that are really hanging us up now. But if we want to talk a bit about the footprint, um, I was extremely fortunate in that I spent a good deal of my youth growing up on a farm in Southern Ontario, my grandparents' farm. And uh, this was in the 40s and 50s. We didn't have a tractor. I have loaded hay by hand with a pitchfork onto a horse-drawn wagon. So that really uh, begins to date me. The point is we were completely self-sufficient on that farm. And I one day was sitting in my grandmother's big country porch, just staring at my plate, which was heaped with food. We'd come in from the field, we'd been working all morning. We were waiting for my grandfather to come in to say grace. And I have no idea what happened. But as I stared at that food, I was suddenly overwhelmed with this sense of connection to the earth because there was nothing. I'm a 10-year-old kid. Nothing on that plate that I hadn't had a hand in growing. And then I felt as if I was falling as if on an elevator in free fall is the way I have described it, with that realization of deep connection to everything else. We Literally, thats I got this insight, we are what we eat, but it goes far beyond that in terms of our connectivity to the planet. And my whole point in, in even repeating this little story is that it's, it's an experience that urban people today cannot have. Uh, we're so disconnected, uh, cities, uh, the whole process of urbanization tends to disconnect people both spatially and psychologically from the natural system of which we are a part and which uh, support us. And so even then, as a 10-year-old, my life as an ecologist began. And it was recalling that singular epiphany as a youth that convinced me I had to study ecology in university. 
and uh, took it all the way through to uh, doing my PhD in population ecology. Now, the human ecological footprint also owes its origins to that farm experience, because even as a kid, I wondered, well, just how much of the farm is needed to support just me? Because if I eat this many carrots and that many apples, and I, that I, you could actually work out, I reasoned, the amount of the Earth's surface dedicated to producing everything that I consume, whether it's my cotton shirt or my wool pants or whatever it might be, everything that goes through the economy, the whole throughput as we now call it, has a connection to the natural environment. I don't like the word environment because it already separates us from everything else, exactly. but it does connect us to nature. So by the time I got through my training and, and uh, found myself employed by a planning school because I wanted to work on the human dimensions of this problem, it was obvious what I had to do. And so I began very early teaching what I then called um, the regional something or other. I can't even remember the original name for this thing. But it was the idea that if we could pull together all of the land needed to support not only us as bodies, but the infrastructure of our technologies and so on and so forth, we would have a fairly good idea of the size of a micro planet that would be necessary to support this city or this region or this country. And then clearly the whole of the earth. Um, oddly, I got a new computer. And this computer was a vertical tower. And I was completing my very first published to be published, hadn't yet been published paper on, on this concept I was developing. And a colleague came into my office and said, oh, you've got your new computer. The department was going to buy one for all of us. I was the first one who happened to get one on my desk. And I said, yes. And I'm delighted because it has such a small footprint on my desk. Bingo. I went back into my paper and changed the terminology for this regional capsule concept into the ecological footprint concept. So there was a series of kind of serendipitous actions that took place here to really give birth to this idea. Going right back to my farming background all the way to the birth of the concept of the, the, the metaphor, as you put it, the ecological footprint. So that's the origin of that particular story. And of course, it's been compelled by some of the people that you've already mentioned. I mean, I, I was blown away by Paul Ehrlich's book, The Population Bomb, at that time. Limits to Growth was a huge controversial study when I was first uh, teaching at UBC in the early 1970s. Rachel Carson's The Silent Spring affected me dramatically because I happened to study bird populations for my doctoral studies and was deeply into understanding the, the dynamics of bird reproduction and how, in fact, the BBC sequence which, by the way, was unknown to science until we had to look, find it by hindsight. Mm -hmm. This is so common in, in our uh, ecological complexity that phenomena that are emergent, I'm, I'm referring here to the thin shell syndrome uh, that the byproducts of DDT produced by acting as a hormone mimic in birds so that they were perfectly fertile uh, normal mating behavior took place, but they would lay eggs which had such thin shells that when the parents rolled them over to maintain the oxygen flow, mm -hmm. the shells would break and the eggs would therefore never hatch. Mm -hmm. And that thin shell syndrome was caused by a hormone uh, replacement affecting the laying down, apparently, of the, the calcium carbonate in the egg shells. And hence, uh, bingo. But to find that out, we had to work backwards. It was an unknown... A physiological mechanism until it was interfered with by these breakdown products of the uh, chlorinated hydrocarbon pesticides. So I thought that was brilliant, both as an illustration of the complexity of systems and why we are going to be hit repeatedly by phenomena about which we have no understanding until we discovered them by hindsight. And of course, it was a brilliant discovery in and of itself. And the fact that she had warned us of the likelihood of these kinds of phenomena, it's just a sheer brilliance. So she was a major influence, but there were many, many, many going back to those times. Yeah, I, I have a question about that. Uh, as I calculate it, um, since Rachel Carson's Silent Spring was published in 1962, you would have still been an undergraduate college at that time, correct? I was, yeah. Okay. I read my, 
I started my doctorate in 1966, I think. So I read her as an undergraduate, yeah. Okay, what was that like for you? And did you get scared by, in the United States, how she was so harassed um, and, um, and, and mocked in some ways for her science? Did that make you want to be a scientist more or less? Oh, much more. Look, I had a very naive understanding of political dynamics. But clearly now what Rachel Carson went through has been experienced by many, many innovators ever since. Anyone who challenges the mainstream is going to be in deep trouble. Um, one of the great readings that I think everyone should take a peek at is something called The Crowd, A Study of the Popular Mind by Gustave Le Bon. I think it was published in 1896. He was the first of a long line of, I suppose, a cognitive psychologist who studied the human mind, particularly how people behave en masse. And there's a wonderful quote from it. This is a bit of a misquote, but I'll try it out anyway. The masses have never sought after truth. They prefer error if error seduces them. Whoever supplies them with error will be their champion. Those who deny their error will be despised wow. something like that yeah. but his point was that once we've adopted a, a particular worldview a way of seeing anyone who challenges it is going to be uh, rejected so uh, rachel carson along with many others has been rejected denied kicked out because her views simply went against the grain they challenged what was already beginning to emerge as the growth dynamic you know, we're stuck in this, this era of the assumption of unlimited economic growth propelled by continuous technological progress. And it only goes back, that idea only goes back to the 1950s. So Rachel Carson's book emerged uh, within a decade of the emergence of this new idea that we could solve all of our problems through growth of the economy. So to have someone who was, uh, a reasonably prominent scientist stick her neck out and argue uh, against the per received wisdom in that domain. Uh, you know, pesticides are good, they're going to stimulate agricultural production and, and so on and so forth, to take one little bit of her work. Uh, it was simply anathema to what was going on. Yeah. Yeah, I, I had first learned uh, about Le Bon from either William Catton um, or William Ophels. I can't remember which, because those are two of the sort of people that I've uh, been major teachers of for my ecological worldview in addition to your own work. Yeah, and, and so moving on, you mentioned you started your PhD in 66. So where were you for the first Earth Day, 1970? And what impact did that have on you in terms of a sense of, wow, maybe the North American publics uh, are catching on to this idea? I honestly, I, I'd be deceptive if I said I remembered where I was on the first Earth Day. I thought it was a great idea, long overdue, but I can't say specifically. I, I suppose I was too engaged in my own work, getting ready to head up north. I did my uh, field work in the high Arctic, or low, well, actually the low Arctic of Canada. But um, it, that's what Earth Day occurred, right around that time, and I was too busy with my own work to get too engaged in it. What about limits to growth when that came out in 72? Did that, you know, get its way through to you and your research then, or somehow did you come upon it later? By 72, I was already teaching in the School of Community and Regional Planning at the University of British Columbia. I was charged there with developing the first ever courses on human eco ecological planning in any university in North America. So, Limits to Growth came out as an absolute gift to just about everything that I was trying to teach in that particular course. Uh, the degree to which it was received with utter rejection and disbelief by my colleagues um, in the months and perhaps a year or two following the publication of Limits to Growth, um, it was sunk as an effective idea by mostly economists who had completely adopted the, the growth ethic. The primary objection was that the model was a primitive and b didn't take into account human ingenuity. 
uh, at the time, human ingenuity was now regarded as the greatest of, of resources. Uh, so that with the advance of technology, we could overcome any uh, resistance to the growth of the human enterprise, population, or the scale of economic activity. And of course, this is the kind of idea that people wanted to believe. It, re it reinforced this confidence in our technological capacity to move forward. And here again, like Rachel Carson, it was a book, Limits to Growth, that said, hey, wait a minute. If we continue down this trail, sometime in the 21st century, population will peak out, production will peak out, pollution will peak out, and the whole thing is going to come tumbling down. Well, nobody wants to hear that. So just as Gustave Le Bon said, we will reject, deny, forget any contrary visions to those which we hold dear and receive uh, with open arms yes. those views and people who uh, support that which we already believe. By the way, there's a good cognitive reason for this, we can get in later. But the point is, uh, limits to growth was sunk from the day one, largely by the economics profession, who simply disregarded it as uh, irrelevant, uh, a sidebar, even dangerous, because it threatened to you know, halt the progress of the human enterprise. Yeah, I mean, my interpretation of that is that the, the civic religion or the secular religion of perpetual progress, driven by technology and human ingenuity, was so pervasive that it was a confront to people's religious uh, worldview, that is their, 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 their understanding of the nature of reality. And, um, you know, it's, it's been vindicated over time, of course, but um, yeah. Well, what about the, the next on the scene would have been, I mean, we had um, the sixth major mass extinction with Norman Myers and the concept of biodiversity with Eel Wilson and Michael Soule starting, um, you know, the biodiversity applied science here um, for dealing, coping with the ongoing extinction of species. And then rapidly on that, in terms of your field of population ecology, on comes um, William Catton. And were you aware of that book in 1980, Overshoot, that he published, or did you become aware of it later? And, and just talk about your relationship with Catton. One of the most remarkable things about Catton's book, Overshoot, to me was that it was written by a sociologist and not an <laughs> ecologist. Exactly. He seemed to understand basic ecology better than any of my colleagues who were ecologists, card-carrying ecologists. And again, it took me some time to understand what was really going on here. Perhaps I should have mentioned earlier that I had always wanted to study something called human ecology. I couldn't do it. I could not find a university in North America that would teach human ecology, as from a biological point of view. There were departments of human ecology in, uh, say, geography departments, but it was all about human use of resources. Yeah. And the uh, sociologists had a little sub-branch of human ecology, but it was based on allegories and, and so on, uh, borrowings from European plant physiology and ecology, uh, just transposed to the human system. So they considered the succession of vegetation in a, in a field, for example, to be comparable to um, the succession of land uses as, we, uh, as a city expands over the landscape. So it was that kind of uh, limited, a very limited perspective on what ecology was. But nobody studied human beings as organism as components of and, and essential parts of nature, of ecosystem. It simply wasn't done. But the point of the matter is, to this day, most ecologists study non-human beings. And if we're going to look at urban ecology, it's how does the city come up as a proper habitat for bird species or ants or caterpillars or the, the distribution of earthworms along a pollution gradient downwind from Chicago might be a typical example of urban ecology. Now that's all very well, but it's really the ecology of earthworms with respect to cities rather than what I took to be urban ecology, which really ought to be all about human beings. It's amazing to me that we couldn't see that people, humans, homo sapiens, are not only the creators of the urban ecosystem, but its principal occupants. Yeah, yeah. Well, how about moving now into also the economics 
uh, side of trying to get an uh, ecological understanding into that. I understand you're one of the founders of the, the field and the Society of Ecological Economics. So could you talk a little bit about, you know, your, your work in that, how you got it started and, and how it's doing now? Well, ecological economics goes back again to the period that I was really getting underway as an academic. The ecological footprint concept is really a, a tool in ecological economics. So let's back up a little bit. The main frame of economics driving the world today is something called neoliberal economics. And it's basically that form of economics which uh, regards the perfect market as the ultimate arbiter of all social values. There's no need for government. Our considerations of moral or ethical questions are outside of the market. Just let the economy work and things will be okay. Its primary goal, of course, is to foster continued growth. And it assumes that uh, continuous economic, or rather uh, technological development is the tool by which we can achieve that. Now, it starts, its starting premise is that the economy and humankind are separate systems. By the way, this is identical to the premise of ecologists that humans are separate from the rest of the world, right? So both disciplines, economics and ecology, separate humans from everything else. So the economists have the human system over here and the ecosphere over here, and there's almost no important connection between the two. They do recognize that the economy draws on the ecosystems for resources and dumps wastes back into it. But technology can cope with both of those. So we see with technological advances that scarcity is constantly being pushed off. Uh, initially, we could drill for oil by poking a finger in the ground and it would gush out. But when those easy to exploit oil wells uh, dried up, uh, we learned how to go much deeper. And now we drill for oil several kilometers below the bottom of the sea, and that may be several kilometers below the surface of the ocean. So we're, we can keep developing technologies. Fracking was another one to, to get new oil uh, that, you know, access resources that we thought were impossible a few years ago. Again, think of something like copper. You used to need several percent copper for an ore to be valuable. We used to think of an ore that had a trace of copper as utterly worthless. Well, today we can exploit that because we've developed the technology to do so. So the economist vision has some support. This continuous advances that keep rel relieving us of scarcity so that growth seems to carry on and so on. But the upshot of this is that the economy then is, vision, is envisioned as a circular flow of money values with no important connectivity to nature understand this. And once you believe that the principle of the economy is a self-generating circular flow of money value and it has no important connection to nature, you have an intellectual concept that enables perpetual growth with no consequence whatsoever from the natural environment. Okay. Now ecological economics starts from a different premise. Instead of seeing the two as completely separate, the economy over here and the uh, ecosphere over here, we regard human beings and their economies and social systems as subsystems of the much larger whole. Exactly. Not only that, they are completely dependent subsystems yeah. on that larger whole. So any uh, increase in the flow of materials to and from the economy and nature necessarily degrades the natural component. Mm -hmm. So in effect, the ecological perspective in ecological economics sees the human system as potentially parasitic on the ecosphere. Now, a parasite is any organism that gains its vitality at the expense of the vitality of the host. And once you adopt the view that the human subsystem is growing by extracting resources, in fact, what, what it does is convert the ecosphere into human bodies and the artifacts of culture. Yes. This is a system in which there's a clear potential for parasitism where the vitality of the host system is destroyed, even as the uh, parasite grows and, and becomes more splendid in all of its ramifications. And I think that's exactly the situation we're in today. The human enterprise continues to grow and expand, but it's necessarily, you see, once you understand that it's a subsystem, the growth of the human enterprise is necessarily at the expense of the rest of the system. So today, if we look at mammals, for example, 
somewhere between we have to go back 10,000 years, human beings were less than 1% of the mass of mammals on planet Earth, mm -hmm. like good estimates. Today, humans are about 32% of the mammalian biomass. And the biomass has actually increased because people have increased the productivity of nature. But humans are 32% of that biomass. And our domestic animals, sheep, cattle, pigs, horses, and so on, account for another 64%, perhaps. So somewhere, depending on whose data you look at, somewhere between 95 and 98 and a half percent of all mammalian biomass on Earth is human beings and their domestic animals. Yes. So that wild nature has been reduced from over 99 percent of mammalian biomass down to just about one and a half to four percent in that range. That's an astonishing example of how the expansion of the human enterprise is necessarily at the expense of the rest of nature. Yeah. When I go to political meetings and I see a politician stand up and say, there's no contradiction between the growth of the economy and the maintenance of the ecosphere, I'm tempted to stand up and scream, bullshit. Yes, exactly. <laughs> we have to understand that humans don't act out of reality. Human beings act out of their social constructs. And we socially construct the realities from which we operate. And the current social construct is this one of unimpeded economic growth um, mediated through perpetually increasing technological progress. And as long as we adhere to that, the reality being human beings contained within nature, the reality is then that we are consuming nature from the inside out. Yeah. We're the apple in the planetary or we're the maggot sorry in the planetary apple yeah yeah well this leads me directly to ask you to um really speak to i i, I recently listened to sam mitchell's fabulous interview with you in his collapse chronicles where the first 10 or 15 minutes he just asked you to explain this plague phase and and you've just written something that you just sent us the other day that will be published here real soon in the tie um, speak to that, because that, that goes exactly with what you're now talking about. Again, if you I think of human beings as any other species, I think there are three qualities that we really have to keep firmly in mind. The first is that we have exactly the same potential for exponential growth as any other species. Exponential growth is a, a simply a growth process by which the doubling time is constant. And if you think about a bacterium being dropped on a, a petri dish of nutrient broth, one cell, bingo, under ideal conditions of the perfect nutrients and, and temperature and so on, that there can be two cells there within 20 minutes, half an hour. But a half an hour later, it's four, and then eight, and then 16, and 32. So the population is doubling in constant increments, as long as the environment is capable of providing the nutrients and other ideal conditions for that growth. So that's simply exponential growth of the population. Human beings are capable, as all species are, of exponential growth. Normally, however, in nature, populations are held in check in their local environments by negative feedback. So if the population edges up toward the carrying capacity of the environment, it gets slammed back by the spread of disease because of higher densities or because uh, there's a shortage of food, or because the increase in that species population has resulted in an increase in predator population, so they slam it back. So normally, populations tend to fluctuate in nature in the vicinity of their carrying capacity. But the point is, humans then normally have been kept in check. The only real growth, substantial growth, in human populations in the last 50,000 years has been the expansion of people over the entire surface of the earth. Uh, within any particular place, we fluctuated over time. Okay. So what happened about 200 years ago is an extremely important event in human history. But it ties to two other aspects that humans share with other species. The first I've already alluded to, and that is that all species will tend, this is a, a, a biological, uh, predisposition, a compulsion, as it were, will expand to fill all the available habitat, all of the accessible habitat. 
And again, people said, not necessarily. And I simply said, well, look, suppose we discovered a new island out in the mid-Pacific, say the size of Australia, that was pristine in all ways. You think governments of the world would get together and say, well, you know, we've screwed up everywhere else. Let's just leave this one alone. Not a chance. We'd be in there and there'd be national flags on every peak and so on as, as the, the area was cut, cut up and carved up and, uh, uh, you know, basically colonized by the human parasite as we've done everywhere else. So we have the same predisposition to expand to fill all available habitat. But the other thing we have is a predisposition to consume all accessible resources. Uh, every species does this. There's no, no difference between humans and other species. We know of cases, for example, where monkeys who feed on clams, oddly enough, and who discover they can crack these clams with rocks, quickly wipe out the entire clam population locally because uh, they've learned to use tools. Well, people learn to use tools. Our technology is just a word for a collection of tools. And it has enabled us to expand, expand, and expand where others could not go, so to speak, because they don't have our technological prowess. So look at now what we've got. We have a finite planet inhabited by a very clever species called Homo sapiens with a predisposition to expand indefinitely. It has a population predisposition to do so exponentially and the technological capacity to continue to provide the resources to enable that expansion and to defeat the negative feedback that would otherwise hold us in check. So about 200 years ago, as modern medicine got a better grip on, on pathologies and so on, uh, we discovered germ theory and we could, uh, could suppress disease and modern medicine helped us increase our survival rate, let's face it, without much affecting the birth rate. In fact, with the uh, use of fossil fuel, we forget the extent to which modern civilization is a product of fossil fuel. Fossil fuel is the means by which we have acquired all the other resources necessary to grow the human enterprise. So look, here's a species with the potential for potential growth, with the capacity to modify the environment so that it ensures a constant flow of resources, and the ability to suppress any negative resistance to that disease, the scarcity, and so on. So just 200 years ago, for the first time in the history of our species, we began a truly exponential explosion, realizing our full biological potential just 200 years ago. So put this in context. If you think of modern anatom anatomically modern humans going back at least 200,000 years, it took 200,000 years to reach 1 billion people. And then 200 years, just 1 1,000th 1, as much time to blow up to almost 8 billion people today. That's an astonishing event in history. Not only that, it's completely anomalous. And yet we take growth to be the norm. Right. Only maybe 10 generations of people at most have experienced enough growth or technological change in their lifetimes even to notice it. Yes, exactly. Understand this? This is profoundly important to get a grip on our current situation. So this period, this last 200 years, that we take to be the norm, and which defines how we define ourselves, is really the single most anomalous period in the history of our species. So it would be an absolute error to suggest that we can go back to the norm after, for example, the COVID virus uh, pandemic is, is resolved. All people can think about is how soon can we get back to normal? And what I'm arguing is that normal generated the problem in the first place. Yes. Normalcy being humans packed together in cities where disease can be rampant and all of we've created the conditions to enable the negative feedback to start coming on full time. So climate change, biodiversity loss, land degradation, soil degradation, uh, the breakdown in uh, the, the ocean chemistry, um, COVID-19, all of these are examples just incipient negative feedback ready to come in and uh, correct this great anomaly that has occurred in the last few hundred years. Now, in theory, we have the intelligence to recognize that this is what's going on. And in theory, we could bring it under control. But so far, there's very little evidence that we've 
uh, realize that at, at the levels that count. You may understand it, I may understand it. Every morning we're being treated in Canada now to an hour long lecture by the prime minister on how they're doing everything possible to get things back to normal as quickly as possible. And uh, I think that's a little bit short sighted. Yeah, you. I couldn't agree more. And that actually leads me into want to ask you, what is it about human nature? Because this is also something that you've studied and, and teach. What is it about human nature that uh, is uh, that theoretically we can address some of these things, but in fact, the previous hundred civilizations, unsustainable city-based civilizations, anthropocentric, human-centered civilizations that have crashed and burned, um, you know, there are people who recognize what could change to shift it, but it never happens. What is it about human nature and your understanding that leads to that? There's a wonderful little book by Bruce Wexler called Brain and Culture. And the bottom line is this, that in the course of the development of the human brain, repeated experiences, repeated ideas, the constant repetition of anything uh, forms synaptic circuits in the brain. It, it shapes the development of our thought patterns so that over a period of time, one can acquire a set way of thinking. We can call it an ideology, it can be a political ideology, it can be a religious uh, doctrine, it can be an academic paradigm, uh, even a scientific theory it becomes imprinted in the brain with its own synaptic circuitry. So once a particular concept associated with that whole idea comes up, the whole circuit is fired. Mm -hmm. So if I am a uh, neoliberal economist with a profound belief in globalization, as soon as I hear trade theory, that whole circuitry starts to ignite and, and, and reinforce itself and so on. But once we've acquired through this experience a particular way of thinking, human beings tend to seek out other people who think the same way and to seek out experiences that reinforce our habitual way of thinking. Do you understand what I'm getting at here? So that a particular ideological framing of events becomes embedded in the brain. And we tend then, once this is in there, it goes back to some other stuff we talked about earlier, we tend to deny, reject, or forget any contrary information. Yeah, yeah. So this is profoundly important in terms of trying to move beyond our current situation. It requires an enormous shock to get people to think of, this is thinking outside the box, almost quite literally, the brain box with its pre-designed synaptic circuitry has to be shattered before we can really grab onto the idea that there's a different way of doing things. And I think we're at one of those critical points in our existence right now. So it is conceivable, if there were a sufficient shock to the global system, that we could sit down and rethink how to restructure it more in conformity to the nature of reality than the current system has been structured. Again, I have to emphasize that we socially construct our realities they become embedded in synaptic circuitry in the brain, we then act out of that synaptic circuitry far more than we do out of the reality. And if there's a mismatch between the way we think about things and the way things really are, we are headed for trouble. And that's the trouble we are in as a global civilization now. The economic paradigm, the political paradigms from which we operate have no useful information whatsoever Exactly. about the nature of the biophysical reality within which we are parasitically embedded. So as long as we operate from that way of thinking, we have no choice. There are no options available to us to change the nature of this destructive relationship. So the first thing, and the reason I keep battering away at this, is hoping we can create enough glimmers of light, cracks in the system, that at some point it bursts open and people got that aha moment where they realize together in some way that, hey, we can do this differently. What if we developed an economy based on the idea that we are utterly dependent on this other system, that we are currently draining? How could we devise a way of, of allocation and distribution of the goods and services of nature so that a much reduced population might live sustainably within the means, the productive capacity of the biosphere that supports us. All of this is possible. 
It's another human construct, but it would be a construct based on the nature of the reality in which we find ourselves. And again, I emphasize, we are currently operating from an economic system that has no formal internalization of the structural, the temporal, or the physical properties of the ecosphere that the economy is parasitizing. And hence, it cannot be anything but pathological. Yeah. We have to break from that pathology or we go nowhere. So all of my work is an attempt simply to understand, to open eyes to a different reality. Well, in fact, the reality, at, the, at least as I see it, and uh, to, to enable us to crack open the current system in ways that enable human beings to live more equitably within the biophysical means of, of the ecosphere. That's the whole mission ahead of us. Um, complexity is a big problem for people. Human beings, the human brain, the human nervous system, evolved in small group contexts. So we are capable of, co of coping reasonably well with a few dozen other people at most in relatively confined habitats over which we could do no significant damage, short term perhaps, and we wove around over a, a home range. But the point of the matter is that human beings evolved to cope with a fairly, within a lifetime of a person, unchanging environmental context, dealing with a relatively few other people. Now, in those circumstances, it became adaptive if in the course of individual development, one came to very quickly assume the beliefs, values, and assumptions, the cultural norms of one's tribe, right? Because once one acquired that, a set of beliefs, values, and assumptions, the mythology of the tribe, so to speak. It not only added to tribal coherence, a sense of, of, of social coherence, but it gave one a sense of personal identity. You could identify with that group psychologically, very healthy, and all the rest of it. It also, by the way, created a barrier, the in-group, out-group concept. The hum in human nature, every culture that's been studied has some in-group, out-group concept. We are over here, they are over there. And again, highly adaptive, 10,000, 50,000, 200,000 years ago. So that's the beginning of the problem that we're in here. Another natural phenomenon, not phenomenon, but quality of humans is what economists actually have called spatial, social, and temporal discounting. People naturally tend to favor the here and the now, close relatives and friends, and so on, over distant places, future times and people they don't know. That's the in-group out thing again. So it's perfectly natural for people to be relatively, uh, what is the word, um, myopic. We are short sighted by nature. And again, there was good reason for doing so. Mm -hmm. if, you don't have, if you don't have refrigeration, uh, you better eat all that food right now because it would go bad. And if you didn't get it, somebody else would would be a typical way of reacting to a circumstance that 10,000 years ago. Today, of course, we could, in theory, abandon that short nature way of looking at things, but we don't, because it's part of our nature to be social discounters, temporal discounters, and um, spatial discounters. So people naturally prefer the here, the now, close relatives over uh, someplace else, some distant future that may not affect them in any case and, and other people. So this tends to uh, cause us to have a very limited view and capacity of imagining futures. But there's another thing that comes out of all of this. And that is that we've come from a place of very simple systems that were at least understandable, if not controllable, to a place where we have created a degree of complexity that is far beyond the capacity of any human mind to wrap itself around. Mm -hmm. We live now in a world of overlapping complex systems, not just the spatial system, but we have the internet. Who really understands how the internet works? Nobody understands money, let alone the entire economy. We've got uh, international mechanisms of global trade and so on and so forth massively complex systems that nobody's capable of understanding in and of themselves, and yet they all integrate in some way that is beyond the capacity of the human imagination. So 
these systems all tend to evolve. And this gets back to your, your question, Michael, about the evolution of, of civilizations. Buzz Holling's work on panicker theory also describes this. Joseph Painter's work on the collapse of complex civilizations. Jared Diamond in his uh, study, Collapse, How Nations Choose to Fail or Succeed. Or a wonderful little shorthand way of getting into all of this is called um, A Short History of Progress by a colleague of mine here in, in Vancouver. Now, what we have to get at here is that we've now created a world that is vastly beyond our capacity fully to understand. And systems seem to go through a cycle. They're fairly simple to start with. Uh, they grow rapidly. They are easy to understand. They reach a point uh, of, of maturing. They, they become uh, a little less uh, complex in the sense that they shed redundant systems. They become more and more brittle, but they get bigger and bigger. But at the same time, if we're talking about a human system, we see the increase in corruption at the top. We see increasing income disparities. We see increasing uh, inability to look ahead, a, a greater tendency to predict the way things are, and so on and so forth. So eventually, the system, which has actually, if you, if you think of Joseph Tainter's argument, he says that the human system is a problem-solving system. And its growth through this trajectory is one of getting increasingly complex. Every time a problem comes up, human ingenuity goes to work, we solve it. So we get really efficient with our new metal hunting and uh, gathering gear, but we deplete our ecosystems. So we have to invent agriculture and that's wonderful, but then we deplete the local soils. So we have to invent irrigation and that's wonderful, but then we have to expand and we get bigger. Now we have dams. Oh, by the way, uh, that's such a big land base. We now have to get an army to defend it against all these invading tribes. So the system just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and more expansive until some problem comes along that we simply can't cope with. Because by this time, there's a division of labor, you've got a priesthood, a governing class, peasant classes, they become disenchanted because they're being overtaxed by those corrupt bastards at the top, and so on and so forth. And then a big issue comes along and the whole thing can come tumbling down. That might be climate change, it might be a bigger pandemic than this one, it could be biodiversity law, who knows? But that's the trajectory that every civilization has ever followed. And we seem to be on that trajectory one more time. If you follow the work of Jared Diamond, they take quite different approaches to the idea of a societal collapse. Um, Tainter uh, sees it largely as a kind of a social administrative problem. The system uh, is incapable of responding, responding at the top for the reason of the corruption and so on that I, I talked about. Diamond see it as more as in environmental factors coming in and, and uh, humans aren't able to control it. But they're both right. That's the point. All of these things are happening simultaneously. We have corrupt leadership all over the world. We have incipient ecological problems all over the world. None of them seem capable of solving this. Plus, we have the human problem of our adopting and, and sticking with paradigms that are, are socially constructed which are comfortable for some of us at any rate, and particularly those who are in decision-making positions. And they don't want to change despite what the rabble say. And in fact, uh, we'll go and build our bunkers and let the rabble go to hell. That's not an uncommon attitude among some of the super wealthy, I understand. I think New Zealand has even had to stop people from the Northern Hemisphere buying up large tracts of New Zealand land uh, precisely to escape from the crumbling of the, of the, the global system. So the point I'm getting at is that there are some problems that may simply not be solvable. Yeah. There are yeah. some problems that may simply not be solvable. Yeah. And we've created a system of such overwhelming complexity. It's utterly unprecedented. Rome was complex. Mesopotamia was complex. Perhaps even uh, you know, Easter Island civilization was complex. But they pale to insignificance compared to the complexity of the global integrated system that we have created. Absolutely. We've not only created a globally inter interrelated system, but we have purposefully, because of the mental models from which we operate, have simplified it uh, by creating, for example, just-in-time delivery, so that if I manufacture what, well, medical equipment here in, in Chicago or in Toronto or wherever, uh, but all the parts are coming from Japan and China, 
and they arrive exactly the day I need to put them together, except when the pandemic shuts down the global transportation system. So we've created this enormously complex, at the same time simple system that is absolutely fragile. Yes, exactly. Wow, that was great. Yeah, I forget what Nate Higgins calls it. That's sort of this amoeba, this 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 um, you know system that's beyond the control of any one individual or group of people, but it has a life of its own, and yet it's ultimately that's so right. fragile. In fact, as we speak, he's on another one of these gatherings talking about the economic and, and financial implications of the COVID virus pandemic, uh, but I'm sure he's using some of the same language. The other, the other resource, when people, are, you know, because I've been studying the rise and fall of civilizations, I've read all the people that you've just talked about, um, and I found William Ophel's little 75-page volume called Immoderate Greatness, Why Civilizations Fail. It's just 75 pages long. It really takes this, this mountain of literature on collapse and, and, and overshoot and stuff and just distills it. Uh, it's, it's the best little short introduction to the average layperson in terms of the various ways that civilizations uh, contract and collapse. Now, usually when we're having a conversation or Michael having a conversation with someone in this post-Doom conversation series, the focus in the life journey is really on the interior side. You're a scientist and you've given us a wonderful sense of what you as a scientist were seeing as the blockages in mainstream science and public understanding along the way. What I'm trying to get now is your wonderful story of growing up on a farm where you really got your involvement in growing everything you ate and a sense of how humans, just for their food, are so dependent on the world around us. And now here you are, about 10 years older than I am, and you're still in the game. There's a lot of people we interview who have left behind whatever they were doing in their career and they're meditating or they're, they're, they're doing some action, not because it's going to make a difference, but because we're supposed to, you know, do something good. Talk to us about your internal journey from that farm where you knew, you knew something was out of kilter when you moved out of that farm. How have you maintained yourself uh, and you're still doing it. You've still got an essay coming up. How are you able to do it? I don't know. <laughs> I, I really don't. Everyone's different. Each of us is a different template to some degree. Um, I've always just been extremely curious and anxious to understand. And I, frankly, I didn't even know that was the case until I, as an ecologist, by the way, I thought I knew everything I needed to know as a smart ass young ecologist when I went into a planning school. And suddenly I'm surrounded by uh, sociologists and urban planners and economists and other people who thought it was a nutcase. Now, you see, this is what happens in a disciplinary context. If one grows up, in a particular discipline. You're constantly being reinforced in your views by colleagues who think and believe the same things, right? So my education began when I, as an ecologist, was inserted into a planning school and pretended to understand what the human system was all about. And suddenly I, I realized how utterly ignorant I was. And I suddenly had to confront that in the planning school. So this it was an absolute revelation to me. And it's what kicked me off on this journey of ultimately learning enough economists to be a member of the group of ecological economists and ultimately a co-founder of the Canadian Society for Ecological Economics. I saw that we had to begin to cross and blend and integrate these disciplines if we were ever even to understand each other's language. And so, uh, this is just tremendously exciting to me because it opens up potential, potential, potential. So the idea when I, I had, I didn't have to, I had prostate cancer. So I retired from the university thinking I might not have a whole bunch of time left at 68, but I've been busier ever since than I was then exploring the same kinds of ideas because I can't do anything else. It's just the way I am. I want to continue to think about these things and wonder what the heck comes next. I think I'm finally getting it because you're one of the few people in this series uh, that's in a position to be able to um, work the mainstream 
towards shifting ideas. And so you're still in the game. Uh, I don't get a sense that unlike a lot of us here that we've curled up on the couch in a fetal position and gone doom for three days. You haven't done that because you're working in ideas. You're not activism. Us activists out on the streets, you know, protesting this, that, and the other. And at some point you just give up, but you're still in the game because your ideas might still make a difference. Do, do I have you right? Is that, is that who you are in this? Well, that's my hope. I mean, I don't, have much confidence that my hope will be realized, <laughs> to be perfectly honest, but it is my hope. I mean, you mentioned the ecological footprint. I described it a little bit earlier. It was a, a metaphorical concept. I had no idea that it would become within a decade, probably the best uh, known indicator of, of sustainability, at least among people who even begin to think that way. So the, the an idea, the idea that we are so intimately connected to the ecosphere, it never occurred to most people. It just had to be birthed in language. Yes. You see what I'm saying? Ecological footprint is just a linguistic term, but it captures so much because people see an imprint. It's on the land, and they make that mental connection and extend it. It's not difficult to understand that if I eat, you know, 27 pounds of parrots, there had to be a specific, you know, two square meters of the Earth's surface dedicated to producing those carrots. But that applies right across the board to everything. And that's not hard to get. So once people get some insightful little ideas, they begin to act out of them. I mean, that's the whole idea of socially constructing our reality. See, I believe there is a reality out there. We simply have to put it together in our heads in some way that maps well to that external reality. Yes. Right now, here we are on planet Earth, the most complex entity you can possibly imagine. And we're trying to navigate it, fly it through the universe with the intellectual equivalent of a 1955 Volkswagen Beetle driver's manual. It, it's simply, it's a, a complete mismatch. It just doesn't work. Yeah, yeah. Amen. Any final things you want to say to bring this conversation to completion? This has been absolutely fabulous, Bill. I guess that there is one thing that it, it, it's sometimes difficult for scientists to talk about, and that's the need for love and compassion. Human beings do not, will not protect that which they do not love. And one of the great regrets that I have is, is the, and I, I, I acquired this from years and years in you know, planning school, urban and regional planning is the complete dissociation most urban dwellers have from the landscape, from the ecosystems that support them. There's no cognitive sense that we are literally a part of nature, that we are made out of star stuff, if we want to use that old uh, analogy. And so we have no love for nature any longer. Now, when I say we, I'm talking about the, the majority of society, the governing system and all of that. Some individuals do, obviously, but for the most part, we are an alien on our own planet. So until and unless humans reacquire some sense of compassion for other species, some sense of compassion for other human beings in other places. So please let us have some compassion for other humans, for the rest of nature, and for this planet upon which we live.